webinar sessions have been developed in partnership with the University of Scranton Small Business Development Center. And they're designed to help provide artists of all types, visual um, uh, sculptors, filmmakers, poets, uh, with the knowledge, skills, and the support that you need to start and to run your small business. So, as you know, the title of today's presentation is Building Your Arts Business, Understanding Insurance and Legal Business Structure. Both, of course, are important aspects of managing a small business. Joining us today is uh, three ladies that are going to share their expertise. We have Donna Simpson, who is a consultant manager with the Scranton Small Business Development Center. And Donna is going to provide us with an overview of the Small Business Development Centers and the information on how you can access a center um, in your neck of the woods. And then also joining us, we have Lindsay Loft, who is the owner of Chamberlain and Reimer Insurance, Insurers. Excuse me. Uh, Lindsay will be sharing her expertise on the various types of insurances that are needed to run a small business. And then we also have Chris Fendrock, an associate at the firm Myers, Breyer, and Kelly. And she will talk to you today about different options for legal business structures. And uh, we would just like to take a moment, the PCA, uh, to thank Donna and Lindsay and Chris for all of the time and energy that you three put into today's webinar presentation. I know how much goes into that and pulling together the right information for the audience. And so we're just very grateful for all of the hard work. And thank you very much for being with us today over the lunch hour. We're happy to do uh, it. Well, thanks, Donna. And you all still see on your screen right now um, just kind of a welcome page. And at the bottom of the page, it mentions that um, all participants are going to be on mute during the call, and that will help reduce the background noise. But if you'd like to ask a question, if you have questions that come to mind throughout the presentation um, or questions at the end, you can submit them in two different ways. There is a message pane in the webinar interface. Uh, you can type the message in there or the question in there. Or you can raise your hand, which is the, the little hand icon. Uh, if you raise your hand, I can unmute you, and then you can just ask the question over the, over the phone or over the uh, microphone on your computer. Um, we're going to save questions until the end. So there's going to be three different small presentations, and then we're going to have time at the end um, to take some questions and to hear from all of you. And if we run out of time, um, what I will ask is if you can send me questions via email, and you'll see that any questions you're going to want to send to jadunlap at pa.gov. And it's right on the welcome screen there. You can send them to me. I'm happy to forward them on so we can get those uh, answered for you. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass the webinar over to Donna and uh, sit back and enjoy and grab your lunch. and. Um, hear about insurance and legal business structures for your small business. So if you just hang tight one second, I just need to pass Donna uh, the presenting rights, and we will get started. Great. Are we there, Jenny? All right, excellent. Yep, we see it. It looks good. Oh, good, great. Well, thanks very much for inviting us. It's, it's good to join you. And these two topics, the legal and the insurance issues, are really topics that are tough for a lot of businesses, and I know especially for artists because sometimes they don't realize they're a business, and there are some considerations that they need to, to take care of. So we're going to be talking about that in a minute, but talking about that in a minute, but before we get going, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the Small Business Development Centers. I happen to be at the Small Business Development Center at the University of Scranton, but all of the centers are dedicated to really helping small businesses start, grow, and prosper. And we work with all types of businesses, from very, very small one-person businesses to, to ones that you might not even consider small. So a whole range of opportunities there for businesses to work with us. We're part of a state and national network of small business development centers. Oh, my thing's not working here. Oh, there we go. So we're part of the state and national network, and the next slide shows a map of all the different service areas that we have. 
Our center deals with eight counties in Northeast Pennsylvania, but you can see by the way the map is broken up, there are 18 centers that people can take advantage of. Our next slide actually gives you the names of them. And I know we're going quickly here, but if anybody was interested, you can just go on to Google and type in Pennsylvania Small Business Development Centers, and you'll be able to get a link that shows all of the variety of, of centers. What we do is provide information to businesses, just really to help them stop, start, grow, and prosper. And it's confidential, it's at no cost, and it's very easy to access. We do a number of different things, for instance, helping people who have no idea if this business will even work, the one that they've considered. So we can do feasibility studies for them. We can work with business plans. We can help develop marketing plans. And really just anything related to the conduct mm -hmm. of either getting started or being in a business. What we won't do, oops, sorry, what we won't do, or we can't do, we don't have money to lend. So we don't do that. We don't give specific legal advice. We're not going to write your business plan. And we're not your accountant. And we're also not your attorney. So, but we're there to provide assistance and guidance to you as you go through the process of working with your business. So, as I mentioned, our services are free, confidential, and that's thanks in great part to the Pennsylvania Commun Department of Community and Economic Development. The small, business develop, or the small Business Administration, and then each of the centers hosts college or university. In our case, it's the University of Scranton. We are very grateful to all the assistance they provide to us. So if you need to contact us, the Small Business Development Center at the University of Scranton, I think your best bet is to use Google to get to us, and we're happy to work with you. So first step, we're going to have Chris Bendrock. And if you'll give me a second, I will make an effort to change, change our PowerPoint presentation. And we'll get Chris started. There we go. Chris Bendrock has been a great friend of our SDDC for over the years. She's, um, every time we call on her to help us do a presentation and inform an audience on legalities of owning a business. She's right there for us. So we appreciate her so much. So thanks, Chris. No problem. Hello, everybody. Um, I just want to give you a very quick background about myself. Um, I have been an attorney for about eight years now, working um, with a lot of small businesses. Um, I practice in Scranton. My background is I started out as an engineer. I went to the University of Texas, um, and I practiced engineering for about four years, and then I decided to go to law school, and that's where my path has been since then. Um, in my practice, we advise a lot of small businesses, like I said, and a lot of larger businesses. So we see everything um, from the startup to the, the family business that has been out there for many years. So my presentation today is mainly focused on, um, you know, business structures, the type of business structures that are out there, um, which we'll spend most of the time on contract issues, uh, very quick intellectual property um, discussion, and then um, maybe some business succession planning, um, you know, family and, and sales and those types of things. So we'll just go ahead and get started. There's my contact information. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or give me a call. Um, my phone number is not there, but it is on our website. Um, okay. So the first thing is, is, you know, a lot of folks come and see us because, you know, if you're not an individual, you're, you're two folks getting together to start a business, and you want to ensure that your business runs smoothly, and then if any sort of um, conflict or issues arise between the two individuals, that um, there's a mechanism in place to resolve that conflict. And so business structures provide a lot of that, um, you know, formality between two individuals. But as you'll see when we go through that, that's not necessarily um, – something that you need to have if you're on your own, or it could be something that you form and with the anticipation that you might join someone in the future. So there's a number of types of, of uh, business structures out there, and we'll go through each of these individually, but here's just a kind of a summary of the ones that we'll hit today. And there's, there are a few additional ones that um, are out there, but we, they're not necessarily used very often, and so um, they won't be addressed. And if you have any questions about those, please feel free to give me an email. So a 
sole proprietorship is the easiest um, form out there. It means that you're going to do your business um, and you practice, you sell your, your items under your name or you can file what's called a fictitious name with the Department of State and it could be um, Donna Simpson selling Simpson's cakes. Um, and I always pick on Donna, so she's going to, I'm going to pick on, nothing's going to change today. So she would file with the Department of State a fictitious name. Um, it's a $70 filing fee. And later on in the presentation, um, there's information about how to actually do that on your own. Um, and then she can start with her business. You know, checks would come into Simpson's case. She would, um, you know, run her business like anything else. She could run out of her house. She could leave space. She could do anything that she wanted to do. Um, the one downside to being a sole proprietorship is that um, she has no liability protection um, unless she has some sort of insurance to help her out. And Lindsay will address that later. But um, if she were ever to be sued, her individual assets are available for recovery, meaning her individual bank accounts, her home, those types of things. So in summary, the, the upside to a sole proprietorship is that it's very easy to operate. All of your income is reported on Schedule C of your 1040. Um, all of your expenses are reported on the same spot. Um, but the downside is, is that you are open to liability. So next we move to partnership. So a partnership is very similar to a sole proprietorship in that um, you and another individual um, or one or more individuals are in the business for making a proper, uh, profit. So now it's, it's Donna and myself, we're going to make um, Donna's case. Um, and so we're in this together. So same thing, if we want to form a, a name that we work under, we go to the Department of State, we file a fictitious name registration, um, and at that point we'd be ready to roll. Um, we'd open up a bank account, probably under one of our individual social security numbers. Um, any profits or losses would be um, split, you know, based on our ownership percentage, you know, maybe 50-50, 60-40, depending on, you know, how we decide to do that. And then um, any liability that comes, forever sued, it goes to each of us. So my personal assets are now available for any sort of lawsuit recovery, and so are Donna's. So that's one of the downsides to a general partnership. Um, that's the first type of partnership listed on the PowerPoint. Um, we can have an agreement among us as to how things work. Um, you know, if, if Donna wants out, maybe I buy her out. Um, we set the price in the agreement. Um, you know, what happens? You know, there might be some accounting things that you want to address in agreement. Maybe we can split our profits and losses differently um, at all by agreement. So we really have a lot of flexibility in what we do between us. And, and whatever we decide, we should write it down in a formal agreement so that if anything ever arises and we have a disagreement, we have a document to look at to help us, you know, guide our way through that disagreement. So in sum, general partnership is an extension, really, of a, a sole proprietorship um, and that liability is not it will flow through to the owners of the business, um, but it's an, it's an easy way to get started. Um, and you just file your fictitious name with the Department of State. So then we have what's called limited partnership. Um, and this is really used um, a lot for, you know, real estate holdings and maybe some family business planning. Limited partnerships have a general partner who is in charge and who runs everything. The general partner's assets are available for um, liability recovery. They usually own about 2% of the company, but they are in charge of the day-to-day -day operation. The remaining folks are called limited partners, and they're merely looked at as investors. So they've, they're the ones that have put together um, the financial ability for the entire partnership to maybe purchase that property. So if there's a big mall, strip mall, you might see that it's owned by Donna Simpson Limited Partnership. So Donna Simpson would own a general partnership interest. She would control it. And maybe, you know, 10 of her friends have each shipped in 100 grand and they bought the partnership. Her 10 friends that have limited partnership interests do not have any liability. Per statute and state law, they are protected um, from their individual assets being attached in the event of a suit, a lawsuit, or some sort of other bankruptcy or, or um, creditor issue. So that's the benefit of a little limited partnership. We don't, we do not use them um, very much anymore, especially since um, the creation of the LLC in the mid '90s and the statutory formation of the. I'm sure you hear a lot of of the LLC. So limited partnerships really do kind of have, other than the name being limited, they do they have a limited um, 
applicability anymore. Um, so we'll scooch by that one. Limited liability partnership. Um, this is kind of a very unique concept, and it's mainly reserved for professionals and those types. And basically, it, the idea behind a limited liability partnership is that a bunch of professionals, such as accountants or doctors, get together. They pay a separate registration fee for each professional to the Department of State every year. Um, and that it, it basically it says that if it's one doctor gets sued, he's responsible for his, for his liability, but the other doctors are not. So it's a very limited um, form, and we, we really don't see that very often. Um, both the limited partnership and the limited liability partnership are, fo are formed, are created, by filing specific forms with the Department of State. Um, a business corporation. So this is what you'll see a lot of um, you know, big entities um, out there. IBM, Coca-Cola, they're all business corporations. They all have that ink name behind them um, or an LTD. So the way to create a business format, to create a business corporation is you file what are known as articles of incorporation with the Department of State. And they basically say the name, how many shares the business is going to have, and any other special rules that are really, really important um, to the corporation. Um, there's another set of documents called a, a bylaws that govern the day-to-day -day operations of um, the business corporation. Businesses are very formal, and they have very formal structures. So normally um, businesses are you have your shareholders, so that's your group of folks that have gotten together. Um, Everybody has a, a share or an interest in the business, and most of the time they actually receive a share certificate um, in the business. So you own your shares. The shareholders, pursuant usually to the bylaws, will elect the directors. The directors are the ones that oversee um, the, apple, the actual operation of the business to make sure that everything is running correctly. And then the directors nominate or elect um, the officers, your president, your vice president, your secretary, um, your treasurer. So it's a very formal setting. It's probably the, it is the oldest form of um, business entity that's been out there. It has a lot of history in it. A lot of folks like it because it, it does, it's got such a, you know, if you ever get a lawsuit or those types of things, um, it, it, there is a lot of case law out there that, you know, you can look to to help you steer as to what the outcome might be. Um, one of the great benefits of a, business corporation is that everybody, every shareholder in the corporation has limited liability. That means that if the corporation is sued, Donna's case is sued, that Don and I as shareholders, our assets are not liable for recovery. So we automatically get that protection from a statutory standpoint. That's what the law says we're protected as shareholders. Um, the downside of a corporation, of a business, a true business corporation, is that it gets hit with what's called double tax. So if you have a business corporation, which is identified as a C corporation for internal revenue purposes, I know I'm throwing a lot at you guys, and I apologize, it is quick. Um, you get taxed, the corporation gets taxed on any, any income that it receives, um, you know, net of deductions, expenses, those types of things, at the corporate level. And you get to a corporate level rate pretty quickly, it's like 35%. Then whatever's left after you pay your corporate taxes, you distribute to your shareholders because, you know, why else have a business unless you're going to make money? So if I get a distribution, say, of $10,000, um, I get taxed on that in my individual 1040 as well. So I get hit with tax again. Um, so that's why, you know, more and more business corporations are frowned upon. So the IRS has given us um, a mechanism to, whoops, I apologize, a mechanism to, um, avoid the double taxation, and that's called an S corporation. An S corporation says um, any income that I make, my business makes, I'm going to go ahead and report that directly on my own individual 1040. So if my business makes $30,000, and Donna and, Don and I own the business 50-50, um, I would report $15,000 on my 1040, and Donna re would report $15,000 on her, her 1040, and we would avoid that corporate level tax. So the IRS um, has been good to us in that respect. Um, there is a limited time for filing that, so if you form a, a business corporation, um, you need to go ahead and get that form filed, I believe, in three and a half months after your formation. I think it's 75 days. Um, so that would be two and a half months. Two and a half. I apologize. 
two and a half months. Um, so that's a, if you, once you file your article to incorporation with the Department of State, in order to make it what they call an S election, so you get passed through taxation, um, you have 75 days to file a separate form with the Department, um, excuse me, with the Internal Revenue Service. Um, but the benefit of that is that you avoid double taxation. So if you choose to go with a business corporation, I strongly recommend um, that you make that election. So the next thing is the best of, the best of both worlds um, is, a, is a limited liability company. The so limited liability company um, basically says that you get limited um, liability, meaning that the members are protected from liability. So if Donna's Cake LLC, which is the way that we designate a, a limited liability company, is sued, um, our individual personal assets are protected, um, and then any income that we receive is reported on our individual tax return, so we avoid any sort of double taxation. Um, this has been around, I think, for about 20 years now, um, and I think that most new businesses, I would say probably 95% of the new businesses that we form anymore are LLCs. Um, we do form a few business corporations and for various reasons. Um, a lot of that has to do with what an accountant prefers. If, if an accountant prefers a, an S corporation versus a limited liability company, that's what we'll do. Um, because you know, we always defer to the accountant because a lot of times your relationship with your accountant is, is, is all the time, every year, and your relationship with your attorney is um, hopefully just to form your documents and then you know maybe to get them updated at some point as, as your business grows and changes, but you shouldn't see your attorney very often. Um, so we always defer to our accountants, hopefully. hopefully. So um, a limited liability company is formed by filing um, a certificate of formation with the Department of State, the Pennsylvania Department of State, um, and then you will also have in your hands an operating agreement, um, which basically is very similar to the partnership agreement that we discussed um, back when we were talking about partnerships. So the operating agreement is kind of a combination of the partnership agreement and bylaws. It says what the members need to do, um, do they need to meet, what, um, who's going to be in charge of the company, what um, decisions are left open for the members to make, and what decisions are left open for the elected president to make, um, what happens if one member wants out, what happens if a member passes away. Um, it's, so it kind of is the, is the roadmap for the LLC. So the filing fee for an LLC, also for a business, is $125 in the state of Pennsylvania. So it's, real, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, to create any of these entities. So as you move on um, with your business and you decide, you, you know, I started out as a partnership and now I want to go to an LLC because we're really growing and we may have some liability exposure um, that's easy to do. The one thing I want to point out is Pennsylvania, um, and this slide shows you that when there are tax implications to changing your structure and when there are not. The one thing I do want to point out is that if you, you and a partner own you individually or you and a partner own real estate in the state of Pennsylvania and you move it from your individual name to an entity um, that the Pennsylvania Department of State will take the realty transfer tax on that. So if you've ever bought property in Pennsylvania, you, you'll know that that pain is, is, is real. <laughs> um, for example, any I know in Scranton the realty transfer tax is 4.4% um, of the value of the property. So in, in the city of Scranton, if you own a property as you and your partner and you move it to your LLC, you're going to pay a 4.4% uh, realty transfer tax in order to change that name. So that's one of the things that um, if you are looking to purchase a, a building or something like that, that you consider your corporate structure prior to making that purchase to avoid any sort of um, realty transfer taxes at a later date. So here's where, um, and usually I, at this point I would go to these websites and check them out, but the history has proven that if I do this in front of an audience, um, that it never works. So if you go to the Department of State, there's a, there's a link on there called um, Businesses. You go in there and there's forms, and they have all the forms that you'll need to form your various businesses. So you'll find um, the Articles of Incorporation form if you want to form a business corporation. You will find a Certificate of Formation if you'd like to form an LLC you will find a certificate of limited partnership if you want to form a limited partnership. You will find a fictitious name filing if you want to find a, um, file a fictitious name. So the, the website is very helpful. Um, 
The forms are very easy. They have instructions with them. They tell you what the filing fee, mail them in, fax them in. Um, if you have an account number, if you have an existing account with the estate, you can fax them in. And I believe in October they started online filing, uh, which I have not been brave enough to try at this point. <laughs> we still fax our stuff in, but I'm sure shortly we'll move over. Um, so that's the basic of, of filing the form. You fill it out and you send it in and you form. And if you if you mess it up, they send you a lovely letter um, <laughs> that says where you need to make your corrections, and you usually have 30 days to correct it, and they'll allow you to keep your original filing date. Um, so they're they're pretty okay for folks at the Department of State. It's good to know. I think it's good though to use an attorney if you don't know all the ins and outs. If you don't know, there's no substitute for your attorney. Sure. Um, so. In order to operate your business, um, if you are not a partnership or if you are not a sole proprietorship, you will need to obtain an, an employer identification number. Um, the IRS has also made that a fairly simple process. Um, there are step-by-step -step instructions here, but I always find it e easiest if I just Google um, apply for EIN. It comes right up, and you go through and you answer a series of questions, and, it's, you, and it will be tied to somebody's social security number. So you have to have a valid social security security number in order to um, receive an EIN. So when you go to a bank, and so now Don and I have, we've decided to form an LLC. We go to the bank and we're going to set up our, um, our account. So what I need to bring with me is my operating agreement and my employment identification number. So they're going to want to know what number they're going to you know, send me a 1099 to at the end of the year. Um, and then they will also tell you that a lot of those things have changed since the Patriot Act back in 2001. But they're very strict about wanting that, um, that information before they'll, they'll open bank account for you. So that's why it's important to have an employer identification number. Um, you know, your attorney can help you with that. Also, your accountant can help you with that. If you're going to be making sales, um, you will need to go and fill out a PA100. Um, we usually rely heavily on the accountant to do this because it's a pretty specific uh, numbers document. Um, and then if you are subject to any sort of um, sales tax, employment withholdings, and employment taxes, um, I believe the Department of Revenue requires everything to be done electronically now, and you go through the e-tide system. Um, I think if your sales are over a certain amount, you even have to pay electronically. You have to have an ACH transfer. Um, so that's the information regarding the PA100 and, and your state taxes. So very quickly, um, a lot of, you know, you come across a lot of contracts, leases, uh, purchase orders, invoices, you know, your customer contracts, if you have a supplier, you deal with, you know, lines of credit, bank loans, um, if you have an employee. My, my general su suggestion is that if, if you have an employee, I would not enter into an employment agreement in, unless you have a specific reason that you don't want them to compete against you or you have information, um, and, that, and that's really it. So an employment agreement, I, that's the only reason I can think that you really, really need one, um, other than, you know, maybe some other types of specific circumstances that you want to keep somebody from competing with your business. Um, otherwise, Pennsylvania is an at-will state, so um, it's free to let that relationship mature and, and end when it's, and when it's natural. So, um, <laughs> next we have intellectual property. Um, I know probably artists have a lot of questions about this stuff, and this is not something that, it's a very specific piece of law, and it's not something that our office practices. We usually refer these out to, to other folks. Um, but there are some, some ways to protect your property. Um, trademarks and service marks. I'm sure everybody's heard that Taylor Swift has now trademarked certain lyrics, How about that? Um, including this big beat. So um, <laughs> attorneys are at work there. Um, but you can get trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets. Um, and I suggest that if it's something that you want, um, you definitely see it an attorney about you know, filing those and making sure you get those registered properly. Um, Succession planning out, I will very quickly. Um, at, at some point in your life, um, you may decide to transfer your business to someone else or to your, you know, your children, grandchildren, those types of things. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can do it. Um, I know that it's probably beyond the scope of this conversation here, but um, on this slide we just outlined a, a couple of the methods that can be done. You can know if one person dies, they get bought out by the other partner. You can fund it with life insurance. Um, it's basically a way to control who's going to be the next line, next in line to control the business and to keep it running. So, uh, with that said, I ran through this as best I could, and I apologize <laughs> if I have confused anybody. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, shoot me an email, and I can answer your questions. But um, 
good luck, and I uh, wish you the best. Very good. Thanks, Chris. There's so much information related to owning a business that sometimes makes my head spin. So I personally don't think there's an excuse for not having a good attorney. So hopefully if you need one or you do start a business, get a good attorney. All right. So next we're going to have Lindsay Moss. Which, by the way, I think loss is a fabulous <laughs> name for an insurance person. <laughs> and she's going to be telling us all about what we need to know about insurance. Hopefully you're making hear me. Um, again, uh, my name is Lindsay Reinheimer Loss. Um, I'm partner and part owner of Chamberlain Reinheimer Insurance. Um, we're a local family business here in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, we've been in business since 1911. Um, I'm actually the fourth generation of owner. It's, it's through a family run. Um, my father is still active. He's semi-retired. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on me, um, in our family we kind of have an a inside rule. You can't, just because we have a family business, can you hear me? Okay, I'm sorry. Here, I'll get closer. How's that? I hope everybody can hear me now. Um, good. That's good? Okay, good. thank you. Um, in our family, we kind of have a rule. Uh, just because we have a family business doesn't mean you automatically get a job. So we have to kind of earn it, which is actually a good rule. That's something I'm definitely going to pass down to my children if they ever decide to be crazy enough to go into insurance. Um, I will definitely pass it on. Um, one of the rules is, is after you get your MBA, you have to go and work five years outside the family business for somebody else. So I kind of went the roundabout way of being into insurance. I was the child of the family who said, I will never work in insurance, ever. It's boring. I never want to do it. And guess what I did after grad school? I went and got a job in insurance. So um, so that's a little bit, I kind of went through health care insurance first. Um, I sold corporate health care insurance with Edney with Health Care out of Harrisburg for three and a half years. Um, and then I went into actually pharmaceutical. I was a pharmaceutical salesman um, for four years. I worked as a divisional trainer. I worked into a general management. And then I was in a district uh, development um, program through there. Um, so my background's a little diverse, and then I came back to the family business back in 2005. So I've been back here for 10 years, and I worked to the ground up. I started in personal lines, which most of you, if you own a home or you're renting an apartment, you've definitely experienced going through that process of uh, getting your insurance put together, a homeowner's policy, a tenant's policy. Um, if you have a vehicle, you're doing with auto insurance. Um, so that's kind of where I started, and then I went into the commercial side, which is more of your business, which is what we're going to talk a little bit about today. And then, of course, I do all the financing, so I'm the CFO of the agency, so I do now all the financing and accounting behind it. So that's a little bit of general kind of where my background is. Um, I apologize for my sad display of no PowerPoint. Um, I was kind of, I did this a little bit of last minute, so I do apologize for that. Um, if they invite me back next time, I'll make sure to definitely have a PowerPoint for you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about insurance. It's kind of one of those animals that people don't realize how important it is to have it um, until it's too late. A lot of times they'll think about it afterwards or something will happen and they're like, oh, I just want the best price. I want, you know, the cheapest insurance. And unfortunately, with insurance, you're really, you're buying a piece of paper that hopefully will react when the time comes. That's what you're buying. You're buying a promise. So insurance works in two different ways. There is called pure risk and speculative risk. We insure pure risk, not speculative. Speculative would be things like you making the conscious decision to put your money in the stock market. There's a chance you're going to win some. There's a chance you're going to lose some. Insurance doesn't insure that. We insure pure risk, which means we're going to, the risk is the possibility of risk. Insurance is the probability of risk. You're going to have a loss sometime in your future, depending on what type of business you're in. Um, and then our job is to pretty much to figure out, well, okay, here's your background, here's your job, here's your description of what you do, let's see what we can get covered and how it works. Um, but the biggest thing that I want to kind of stress is that insurance is not a warranty, it's not a guarantee, and it's not a maintenance agreement. So if you don't take care of your property that you're renting from, or if you don't take care of your equipment that you're using, the insurance is not going to replace it to the value that you may have spent on it five years ago or ten years ago. That's not the way it works. Um, insurance is uh, used to compensate for damage or loss 
sustained, but it's not to make you better. It's supposed to make you back to the place you were at the time of the loss. And that's called identification. Um, in terms of insurance, when you're starting out a new business, you may not need all the things that I'm going to be going over because you just don't have the um, assets at that time or the probability of that risk at this time. Um, but in the future, you probably will. Once your business grows, you're going to need other insurances to help cover up the cost and to protect you. Um, where Chris was talking about liability, there's areas that insurance will help protect you if you're in a different kind of a form of corporation so that if you do get sued, these policies are going to react. Um, I'm going to start really with property insurance. Property insurance is your building, your content. Um, and just to back up real, real quick is that one of the things with insurance, I think a lot of people have the difficulty of it, it's just the terminology. If, um, we use a lot of big words, but the basis behind them is pretty simple. Think of your property. You think of property, you think of your building or where you're living. Think of your home. Content is if you turn your home upside down, you shake everything out, that's what's content. So anything that's attached to a wall is actually building coverage or property coverage. So those are things just to keep in mind. Um, some of the things that I think when you're looking at property insurance, there's going to be information that an agent um, is going to ask you. Um, even if you're renting from someplace, if you go in and you're renting studio space, if you're an artist and you're renting a studio, you're going to be renting, you know, say 500 square feet of, of an area in one building. The, your insurance agent is going to want to know and the insurance carrier is going to want to know, okay, well, what is that building? How old is it? Does it have security? Does it have a central fire uh, burglar alarm? Does it have sprinklers? Does it have locked doors? Does it have two ways of going in and out? Um, does it have um, updated plumbing, updating electrical, a new roof, an updated heating system? Those are all things that an insurance agent and an insurance carrier is going to look at because they're going to, that's going to determine not only the price that you're going to pay, but also if they're going to cover it or not. Because it, as I said, it's not a maintenance agreement, it's not a guarantee, it's not a warranty. So if you're renting from a spot that doesn't have sprinklers, doesn't have a fire alarm, doesn't have updated plumbing or heating, or the building is really old and the roof is falling down, the problem is is the insurance carrier is going to say, well, guess what? What happens is if you're renting from that spot and the building collapses, that means there's a risk. That means that carrier is going to pay out a claim. So they look at all that when they start to determine your pricing for your policy. And you as the tenant, you should be conscious of what you're going into. You want to know that you're going to be renting from a, um, a building owner or a business owner or building owner, excuse me, that is taking care of their equipment and taking care of their building because that helps you and protects you. It also keeps your cost down. Um, because as I said in the beginning, cost is always something that people look at with insurance. Um, and it's a, kind of a necessary evil. Um, one of the things that I always say is that as an insurance agent or as a small business owner, you want to have a really good relationship with your accountant, with your attorney, and also with your insurance agent. Your insurance agent should know your business backwards and forwards. So when you're making that decision of what agent to go to, sometimes it's easy just to go based on cost but you really need to know that agent knows what you do, and that means everything you do. Um, a lot of times what happens is, um, especially when you're starting out in the day of marketing and the day of online um, selling and advertising, we put a lot of things on web pages. We put a lot of things on newsletters and things like that, um, or Facebook. And we may not actually do them. We only maybe do a little bit of it. We may only do it 1%. The problem is, as an insurance carrier and insurance company, we're going to be looking at your web page. We're going to be looking at your Facebook page. If you say you do one little item that's going to be something that's going to throw it out of like kind of our standard market of carriers, guess what? You're not going to get the rate or the uh, price that you're looking for and also the coverage that you're looking for. Um, insurance is really an animal that we're trying to protect you. We're trying to protect your assets and to make sure that you don't have your personal assets um, taken away from you at a time of a loss or what happens if you have a claim and you have say $10,000 worth of coverage and for instance you have $20,000 actual property in your in your business and you didn't cover that last 10 and you have a fire and everything's destroyed. Well your insurance carrier is only going to pay you 10. That means that extra 10000 that you just lost is coming out of your pocket. Those are things that we need to protect you from and the only way we can do that is really knowing all the information on your business. We need to know exactly what you do. Um, and anytime you make any changes, 
The first person you should be calling is your insurance agent because it's going to affect your premium and it's going to affect how you're covered. Um, I wrote a couple things down on that uh, sheet in terms of property insurance. Things to look at when you're looking at a policy, um, debris removal, ordinance of law. Um, that's a big one, especially if you own your own building um, or if you have property. Um, because if you have a fire or if you have um, any kind of structural damage and the, you have to replace it, if you don't have ordinance of law, what happens is you want it, the new, any time a building gets destroyed or gets hurt or damaged in a claim circumstances, the local area or town, they have what's called an ordinance, and they have to, the building has to be built to, co to code. Well, that code can change. And so maybe 10 years ago when that building was built, your building was built one way. But when you have a claim, that building has to be built to the, to the most current code. So that means there could be additional charges or additional coverages that's not going to be covered unless you have that additional coverage. And that could be an increase of $25,000 worth of coverage to $100,000 worth of coverage, depending on your individual needs. So I wanted to mention it because a lot of times people don't look at all the little extras, and those extras can be very beneficial to you at a time of a loss. Um, I also put in their COPE information. What that means is that's information that the insurance agent is going to ask you. I talked a little bit about before the construction of the building. Is it made with um, a stick built? Is it a frame building? Is it masonry? Is it um, made out of brick? Is it made out of stone? Those are things that insurance agents look at. What are the occupancy? For instance, you may be an artist and you're, you're in a studio. Next door to you, you might have a, I don't know, a battery or an auto repair store, an auto supply store, the insurance company is going to look at who's in the office with you. I know it's not fair, but they will. They'll look and see what's next to you. Because what if they have a fire, the battery causes a, a leak, and then you have an environmental problem, and then that's going to go into your, your own exhibit or your own art. If you're a photographer, it could be your chemicals. There's a lot of things that they'll look at. So the more information you give your insurance agent, the better you're going to be going forward. Um, they're going to they're know how to protect you. Um, going on to general liability, we talk a lot about liability, and I think sometimes people don't really know what that word means. Um, in our reference, we mean it by it's a third party, property damage or personal injury. So what that means is it's not you as an individual, not people who work for you. It's a third party, so it's a, another person out there, for instance, that could be Walking in front of your building, tripping and falling and getting hurt, that's third-party personal injury. Um, third-party property damage, I'm doing work at somewhere else or I'm doing an exhibit somewhere else and I damage some of their tables or chairs, that's third-party property damage. Um, they also have what's called fire legal. Fire legal means you're renting from some office and you cause a fire in that office and that destroys another part of the building, that comes into fire legal. And it's all under what is called a general liability policy. Some of the limits range from um, the standard is usually a $1 million per occurrence, a $2 million aggregate, which means you have a $1 million per occurrence. If you have two claims of during that year and they both are $1 million, you're capped at $2 million. That's the most they'll pay out. If it's, uh, say you have a couple $5,000 claims, you're going to continue on until you hit that threshold of the $2 million. Um, one thing about general liability that's important to reference is that your work or your product is not covered. So if you need liability, for instance, you're making an actual product, you're um, distribution, or, excuse me, distributing something under your name, under your label, that can be covered. It's just, cover, it's just called something else. That's actually called product liability. Um, and there are policies out there that you can get to protect your product, um, but those are um, usually expensive depending on what it is and a lot of manufacturers have those um, it may not really be relevant to what you're doing um, but you don't know you don't know what's going to happen 10 years 15 years down the road you might be doing something like that in the future um, and that's pretty much it on excuse me under general liability the next is your commercial auto um, some of you might have autos that are in your personal name but if you form a corporation you can actually um, put the autos in the corporation name. Um, in some ways, you're going to get higher limits than what you can get on the personal line side. Um, instead of going through your own personal agent, like your state, or your uh, excuse me, um, all state or uh, if it's e-insurance or general insurance, you're going to get, depending on the levels of insurance, the most you can get on the personal line side is usually 500000 unless you're with a certain carrier that can go higher. 
Um, but with commercial auto, usually start around a million uh, for liability. Um, it's a combined single limit, which means it's one limit for everything. Um, and it's always full tort. You don't have the option in commercial auto to do full tort or limited tort like you do in personal lines. Um, and again, some of this is, may not be applicable, what you're doing right now, but in the future you might be having a van to a van or a truck to actually take your product somewhere. This is where it comes into play. Um, the next one is workers' compensation. Uh, workers' compensation. If you're a sole proprietor, you do not have to carry workers' compensation coverage under the state of Pennsylvania. However, you, you can, um, but it's not something you have to. Um, once you start to get a first employee where you actually have a person on payroll, you do, by the state of Pennsylvania, have to have workers' compensation insurance. Um, it's all based on payroll. It's based on class of business, so depending on what type of business you're in, you're, they're going to give you a state rate, and then you're going to have the payroll for that employee times the rate, and that's going to give you a premium. Um, there's some other factors that go into it when you're calculating a workers' compensation policy. Um, one of the things I do want to point out, and I think a lot of times people don't understand the importance of workers' compensation insurance, is that it's actually a criminal, it's a criminal um, act if you do not have workers' compensation insurance coverage and you have employees. Um, it's only if they're payroll employees. If they're 1099 employees, which means they're a vendor or they're a um, subcontractor, um, depending on the carrier, they can actually um, require to have some of those funds for those subcontractors or um, they uh, will be covered individually. They'll have their own workers' compensation policy. Um, but keep in mind that it is, there's actually a fine that applies to it if you're found with the state not having workers' compensation insurance, and there's also some jail time, too. So it's a big offense if you have employees and you're not paying workers' compensation insurance. It's, something, it's a big no-no. Don't do that. <laughs> if I get anything, don't do that. Um, so, and I bet the attorney could just vouch for that. Do not, not have workers' compensation insurance if you have employees. Um, and that's kind of the basis of the four main coverages you would look into. Once you get bigger and once you have accumulated some assets, you'd be looking at some excess liability. And what that means is that $1 million, $2 million that I talked about before, you'd be looking at an umbrella policy or an excess liability, and that gives you some coverages above that. So if you hit your threshold because of a claim, it's going to give you some extra coverages. Um, but that's kind of a good overview of kind of the basics of information. If I recommended anything, um, you'd want to have, if you're renting a spot, or if you're even in your home and you have a product or you have business um, equipment, uh, those are things you want to get covered under a business policy. Um, a lot of homeowners will exclude it. Some homeowners do not. Some homeowners will give you, there's actually an endorsement that you can add on or an addition that you can add on to your homeowners that will cover some of your business products. Um, but those are things that will be, can be excluded from your personal homeowner's policy. Um, so, content is definitely one in liability. Um, many of your vendors, or if you're, if, you do, if you're an artist that actually displays their art someplace, or if they're having shows, trade shows, if you're going to an ex, um, exhibit, they're going to ask for what is called a certificate of insurance, and they're going to ask for liability coverage um, to show proof that you do have coverage. So, if you cause damage to any of their property while you're visiting their location, you, they have a policy that will react. Um, so, those are just terminologies that you're going to hear, um, so you kind of know where they're coming from and what you would possibly need going forward. Um, in the insurance market, we have two types of carriers. We have what is called the admitted carriers and the excess and surplus carriers. These are actually the insurance companies. Um, insurance companies in the state of Pennsylvania and through the Insurance Commission, um, if they're admitted carrier, there's what is called covered under the PIGA fund. What that means, we call it PIGA. What that means is if, God forbid, that insurance company goes under, it, it's lost all its money, it, it, it bank, it's going into bankruptcy, the PIGA fund under the state of Pennsylvania will actually pay for any claims or any financial loss if you occur during that time when your policy was enforced. Um, if it's what is called an excess or surplus carrier, that means they are not covered under PIGA. So if that company goes under, you have no recourse against your loss. Um, there's no insurance company that's going to help pay for that. So those are things that you want to look at when you're looking, when your insurance agent comes to you and gives you 
um, a premium. And the easiest way to kind of distinguish if you're using an amenity carrier or an excess and surplus line is going to be taxes. If it's an amenity carrier, there's no tax. So if you have a what is called a business ownership policy, or we in term in the insurance field it's called a BOP, which is kind of a homeowner's policy for a business. It throws a lot of extras in. Um, so if you get that through a standard carrier, for instance, I'll just name one as Nationwide or Harleysville, or um, and it's a $500 BOP, that's why you're paying is $500. If you go to an excess carrier, you're going to have say that $500 premium but then you're going to have a 3% state tax and a $25 stamping tax. So that's a way to distinguish when you're looking at a quote from an agent to determine if you're under the admitted carrier or an excess carrier. Um, and how, that, how it determines if you're, which market you're in um, comes down to the type of business you're in. It really does. Um, the admitted carriers will cover a lot of your standard businesses out there, your florists, your dentists, your doctors, um, a lot of your craft stores, things like that. But if you do something a little bit different, you're, drawing a, you're trying to do a little bit um, something new out there in the market, most of the time you're going to go the excess level um, just because it's not, I guess, well known in the standard market that the insurance carriers have found enough history or enough claims experience to really determine if it's a, something worthwhile, if it's um, profitable, if there's not a lot of losses in that kind of type of business or um, job description. So those are things just to keep in mind when you're looking at it or looking at a policy. Um, <laughs> well, I'm actually almost out of time. I think I'm at, at the end of time. Um, I have a couple things also listed there, exclusions, deductibles, and retention. Um, also, if you're an artist and you're, you want to look at transit coverage, um, and um, exhibition covers, or excuse me, exhibit covers, because those are things that are outside the norm of the standard policy. Um, but thank you so much. I hope I didn't bore, bore anybody. I know it's kind of a dull topic sometimes, but it's an important topic when you're doing a business. So thank you so much. And um, if you need to get in touch with me or if you have any questions that I can't answer right now, uh, Donna does have my contact information. I apologize for not putting it on there, but I will next time. So thank you. Great. Gosh, there's so much good information from both of you. Thank you so, so much for doing that. Do we have any questions? Yeah, Don, this is Jamie. Uh, and yes, yeah, thank you both, all three of you, so much for being with us today. There was a ton of really good information there. So I do have some questions from the Great. audience. And um, if folks, you know, if, if you think of questions after the fact, you know, kind of processing all the notes that you might have taken or thinking about something, as everyone mentioned, um, you know, shoot us an email, and if you shoot it to me, I'll make sure that I pass that on to um, either Donna uh, or Chris or Lindsay, and, and they can help answer that. So uh, the questions that I do have, and I think we have time for a few possibly. Again, right. folks, if you have questions, you can put them through the webinar interface, or you can raise your hand, and I can unmute you, and you can ask it that way. Um, let me flip over to here. Uh, okay, one question, the quick one I can answer myself. Um, will we have access to the presentation following the webinar? I have recorded today's webinar, um, and hopefully sometime next week, by the end of next week, I'll say, it'll be posted on our website. So that if you want to reference it again, you can, or if you um, know someone that also might be interested in this information, you can share that with them. Great. Um, let me see here. So actually, I have several questions. I will start with one on, um, let's see. Are there any benefits to being associated with multiple LLCs? Specifically, if they're a member of several groups, is it wise to have multiple LLCs? And sorry for the phone ringing loudly next to me. Sorry. <laughs> Did you hear that? Sorry, that phone is really loud. Did you hear what I said there? I did. Um, okay. I think I, if I, I'm hoping I'm answering the right question. Um, there's no downside to having LLCs, a lot of LLCs. And I think um, if you have a, if you want to start a business with, um, if I want to start a business with Donna, we can have an LLC. And I want to start a second business with Lindsay, um, we can also have an LLC. And I don't think that there's really a downside other than making sure that you keep up with separate bank accounts separate tax accounting, those types of things. You might have different interests, um, and it's never beneficial to have somebody in your group or in your business 
that is not interested in your goals. So, you know, Lindsay may not care about Donna's cakes, and so therefore, you know, she's not a good fit for our LLC. So Lindsay and I may start a new business, you know, dog walking. So it's completely um, up to you how many you, how many LLCs you have. Um, just be cautious that you don't commingle funds. I don't, I'm not going to put a, a, a check from um, my dog walking business into my cake business um, and, and vice versa. So it's, you don't commingle funds. You've got to keep everything separate, um, and you've got to keep your accounting separate. So um, there's no issue with having multiple LLCs, and I, I think that's the question. I'm hoping that I'm yes. answering it. Okay. Yes, I believe it is. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so now I have an insurance question, and this is a little bit lengthy, so just hang tight. Um, <laughs> this artist is producing a play that will be touring to parks in Pennsylvania and in Maryland. The shows are outside. There's no heavy equipment, uh, set, lighting, or sound. Uh, for permitting some parks, uh, for permitting, excuse me, some parks want this artist to add them, their employees, and the employees of the city to the insurance. Is general liability insurance the best way to go? Will it cover the performers and the city and park employees? And how would adding these people for only one day possibly affect the kind of insurance I should purchase? OK. Um, <laughs> Did you get all that? Sorry, I told you it was lengthy. <laughs> I'm trying to get that. There's a couple different things that I can see um, just off the top of my head. Now, again, I do want to specialize. This is not something that I specialize in, so you definitely want to talk to an agent that maybe specializes in this kind of coverage. Um, but in terms of, I, I guess I want to make sure and clarify, who would be adding, who's asking to add? The parks are asking to add the play people onto their policy, or the park wants to be added onto their policy? It sounds like, for this question, it sounds like um, yeah, the park it's saying the for permitting, some parks want him to add them, their employees, and the employees of the city to the insurance. Okay. Um, so would, does that make does that clear? Yeah, I, I understand, yes. Yeah. The, the only thing that they could do, the general liability policy would cover the um, playwright or the people who are actually putting on the play. The um, park owner can actually be listed as what's called an additional insured um, because they have a financial interest in that play going off well in their area or in their park. Um, and it would be a one day only for that event. And what they would do would be called as, what is called a certificate of insurance is what they would ask for. And on that certificate of insurance, it would list that park name as additional insured for that day for that event. Um, the only thing you want to look at is two things. When you're running your general liability policy, you want to make sure that you have what is called a blanket endorsement on that general liability policy for vendors or for incidents like this. Um, so that way you can add additional insurance without having to incur costs. Um, because there's some carriers that will not allow you to do a blanket one, and you have to add them per event. And that could generate costs for you on your insurance policy. So you want to look at that on when you're looking at your documents of your general liability policy to see if they have what is called a blanket endorsement for additional insurers. Um, but now it's mostly be the name of the uh, park is going to be what's going to be listed. In terms of individual employees, they would never be listed on a policy. Um, only the park or the corporation or whoever owns the property would actually be listed on that policy. And it would only be not listed, excuse me, it would only be for that certificate for that one day event. I hope did I answer that correctly. Yeah, that was I believe so. Um, I mean that that seems to clarify it for me. And again, folks, if because I'm gonna try to squeeze in one more quick question and so I'm not gonna get to everyone's questions, but um, I will forward this on to um, uh, the team today and, and they can maybe assist with answering these questions after the fact. Uh, but thank you for that. That was, uh, I think that clarified it nicely. Um, the one question I'm going to squeeze in, and then we'll wrap up, is uh, a legal question. Going back to that, um, do legal issues, laws, etc., do they change from state to state? The answer is yes. Um, <laughs> in, okay. You'll see a lot of folks, um, I guess, incorporate their businesses in the state of Delaware because the main reason is because Delaware has the most case law out there. As we talked about earlier, um, you take advantage of that case law um, and the established rules and principles that they have in Delaware. 
But more and more um, folks are, you know, most of the corporations or LLCs that we form are Pennsylvania, um, but there are some things that might be different from a state to state, and it's definitely some sort of uh, consideration that you want to take into um, making a determination as to when you form your business. But uh, Pennsylvania is a fairly friendly state. Um, you know, we don't, we, we, it's not, we're not like we're saying you need to form your, your business in Delaware or here or there or wherever else. Um, you know, there are states we avoid, New York. Um, <laughs> so New Jersey is a little bit tougher um, on businesses, but I guess the, the answer is yes. Great. Well, thank you. And as I said, there are some more questions. I'll forward them to you ladies so you can um, see what questions that we didn't have a chance to get to. But, but thank you so much again. This was all really helpful information. And again, folks, we are going to have this posted on our website. So if you want to take a look at it at again, uh, add it again, excuse me, or share it with colleagues or friends, uh, please by all means do. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for, for hanging in there over the lunch hour and to the team of presenters today. Really wonderful. Thank you so much on behalf of the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. It uh, was an excellent session. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for having us. Sure. And, and Donna, if you would like to